Shannon Watkins, and I'm here today with Jay Shallon. Jay is the Martin Center's Director of Policy Analysis and has worked here since 2007. He recently authored a report entitled Bolstering the Board, Trustees or Academia's Best Hope for Reform, which is what we're here to discuss today. Before we get into the details of your report, let's start with the big picture view. What's the state of academia? Are we anywhere near true reform? Okay, well, I started with a basic premise, and that is that academia is a very troubled institution. Now, it does do a few things well, like uh, STEM education and research, but that's sort of just puts up a facade for a lot of the problems that exist. And, um, I mean, when you consider that the very basic values of higher education are being challenged, what's happening is um, typically, or, or traditionally, higher education has favored the pursuit of truth over all other values. And right now there's a conflict where in much of academia, they're shifting to a standard of social justice. And um, this is not going well. Um, a lot of academia is actually antagonistic to the um, majority of the people it serves. So um, as I said, I consider it to be a um, a troubled institution. Now, I started this uh, by asking two basic questions. Why is all this happening and can it be solved? When it uh, comes to why, uh, the first place you look is leadership. And looking, the board is supposed to provide the leadership for the system, and it's clearly not doing that. And this is because the system of governance that is actually in practice in higher education, which is called shared governance, sort of creates this inability to solve problems. Now, as far as solutions go, um, I looked at it and I said, well, they're not going to come from inside academia. If it's going to be solved, something's going to come from outside, some outside force. The other thing is governance has to be streamlined. There has to be some sort of hierarchy reintroduced into the system. How did shared governance evolve? Okay, well, this, this sort of happened back in the... The beginnings of it were back in the late 19th century. Um, there was uh, the academic freedom debate. For a long time, uh, academia in the United States was basically religion-driven. Um, they used the Bible re uh, revelation as the standard by which everything was judged. In the 19th century, you had empiricism move in as a new standard, and there was a lot of conflict between that. Generally, the boards favored the older standards, the faculty favored the new, and because the new was so powerful, um, it gave a lot of more power to the, the faculty. The other thing is there was such an explosion of knowledge that trustees were no longer able to judge a lot of the specific uh, courses and knowledge that people were supposed to learn, and they wound up relying on the expertise of the faculty. So the faculty gained considerable um, power. Another thing that happened later on, um, maybe in the from the mid twentieth century, is on is um, academia grew at such a rapid rate. There were many more agencies, many more departments, many more of this outside influences and everything, and um, it kind of elevated the administrations to somehow get a handle on all this and so they increased in power as well and that power came also at the expense of the board. 
Why is shared governance so damaging? Is there a lack of accountability? Um, there is supposed to be accountability. Legally, there is accountability. The boards have a fiduciary responsibility to ensure um, proper finances and a good quality of education and so on. However, shared governance gets in the way um, and uh, it's sort of like the buck stops nowhere. Um, with shared governance, you need to form consensus and uh, that and majorities, and so there winds up being a lot of horse trading. There ends up being a lot of uh, ways in which fairly low-level individuals wind up making important decisions, and um, it just clogs the gears of governance in a lot of ways. And it also tends to promote a very narrow expertise over the, you know, a more broad-based societal type of uh, thinking that you really, you really need that broader-based thinking at the governance level. Another problem is it overly focuses on protecting the academic f freedom of faculty only when in today's world, it should also be addressing the faculties and the administration's excesses against other stakeholders. What are boards neglecting to do? Well, they're sort of neglecting a lot of their fiduciary duties. They're not getting involved in a lot of the things that they should be getting involved in. Um, they're not setting the intellectual direction um, of the university. Um, they should be demanding that the schools provide them with better information that they're getting. And they're, um, I mean, one of the things that they're failing to do is to ensure a quality education. How can board members ensure a quality curriculum? What role do they have in deciding what is taught? Uh, a lot of them are not academics. They're lawyers or businessmen. Okay, well, there's really two areas that I think, if we're getting down into specific details, two areas where they're really failing. And one is um, the general education programs where they can have a lot of effect. There's really, uh, you know, there's not much they can do with the major, with the, the major disciplines that students focus on, but the general education is an extremely part, important part of a student's education today. And the boards need to take control of this thing because today it is a uh, general education programs are an unholy mess of like um, some schools give people thousands of courses they can choose from for, to fulfill general education requirements. General education is supposed to be consist of the very most essential knowledge. It's the kind of thing that kind of creates a glue um, between students and um, it should kind of promote sort of a national culture in some ways. But when you have thousands and thousands of courses and some of them is minute and irrelevant, I used to make the joke, uh, you know, they'd have the history of snacks as a general education requirement, but there are actually courses that come pretty close to being that. Mm -hmm. um, I know at uh, Chapel Hill, one that I mentioned in the report is there's a, you know, somebody teaches a course on Japanese skateboarding culture as a general education requirement. When <laughs> that does, I do not see that as the uh, most important education or most important knowledge somebody should have. Another thing is they need to use their actual powers to review hiring and promotions, especially hiring. Um, they can prevent many uh, bad, uh, many of the worst hires. Um, you know, there's there's a there's one famous case that I cite is the one of Stephen Salida at the University of Illinois. 
Um, he was a radical Palestinian activist who tweeted things like, um, oh, he praised the murder, kidnapping and murder of some Israeli teenagers and things like that. Um, the board of trustees at Illinois almost never used their power to, um, review faculty hires, but in this case they did, and they did the school a great favor by preventing this rather irrational, unhinged individual from having a permanent faculty job. Um, so that's something that they could exercise their actual powers much more frequently. Do board members have final say in approving faculty hires? You know, in most systems they do. I know in the University of North Carolina system, it's the uh, it's the campus trustees, the the um, say the UNC Chapel Hill trustees or the NC State trustees who actually do have a final say. Why is it best that the board is in charge? Okay. Um, well, first, the boards represent society better than the other stakeholders in the system. Um, they're much more open to outside influences. They have a broader range of experience. Their identities are not tied up with higher education. This is not their career. So expertise tends to be very narrowly focused and um, people who are in a narrow discipline tend to adopt groupthink ways. Um, the, uh, so the board is not like that. Um, the administration too is, um, whereas they're in charge of day-to-day -day, uh, operations and everything, they're incentivized, say, in one example, to maximize revenues rather than cut costs. The board would be more likely to cut, you know, focus on um, being more efficient rather than always just trying to bring in more money. Their incentives are more objective-based rather than personal-based. Um, so that makes them probably better to run things overall. And how did you approach your investigation? Well, the first thing I, start to do, I started to do was look at current practices, and that put me to sleep. Um, current practices tends to be, um, the analysis tends to all be done by very establishment figures. They tend to have like a, uh, the old fish and water analogy approach. Um, when you're a fish um, in the ocean, you don't realize that you're in water because you don't know anything other than water. And that's, that everything was in a very narrow range. So then I moved towards more of a, uh, looking at the basic incentives. And um, I applied some things like the principal agent problem to it or stakeholder analysis. But it's a very hard problem to put into something like that because, the problem is so vast uh, that you'd be just endlessly working through things. Um, so I just kind of like uh, just took examples of, incentive, of um, incentives and worked through them. Um, one was the issue of quality education. Like everybody assumes that uh, say the faculty and the administration are concerned in students or want a quality education. But when you really get down to look at it, that's not always the case. A lot of students just want to get a piece of paper. Um, all they, uh, they want to do the, they want to get the most credentials for the least amount of effort and a quality education, which requires effort and work and studying might be not what they want. Um, for teachers, many teachers, most teachers are very good, or most professors tend to provide a quality education, at least in some measure. Um, but there are some who, the incentives are more for research or something else, or they have a political ax to grind. And so 
for them, quality education isn't really all that important. Um, administrators tend to favor reputation over the actual quality of the education. They just they want to have something they can sell to uh, donors and others. Uh, so they're more concerned about the appearances because providing a quality education sometimes means tackling very difficult problems that can create adverse publicity. Um, adverse publicity hurts your reputation, and so they'd rather just sweep things under the rug. The trustees also kind of uh, favor reputation, but always they're they're the one group that has this legal responsibility, this fiduciary responsibility to provide a quality education. So, um, so that, that's one way where you look at the incentive structure. Another thing I did is look at basic psychology. Um, I looked at the phenomenon called groupthink. Um, in which obviously um, certain groups tend to adopt the uh, beliefs of the group rather than moving around or developing individualized ideas. And academics tend to be particularly susceptible to this. Um, for one thing, academia attracts ideologues. You have self-perpetuating self -perpetuating departments, which um, that means that the people in the department choose the new people to, that they want to hire to succeed them. And um, naturally, people are attracted to those who think like them and are going to promote their ideas. So um, there's this natural tendency towards groupthink. And we see it in um, a lot. There's a lot of empirical studies about uh, voter registrations out there. And in, in one case, in one uh, I looked at a few studies. In 1972, there were in uh, some social st sciences and humanities departments, there were four Democrats for every Republican. In 2016, that had moved up to 11.5 Democrats for um, each Republican, and it's still moving in that same direction. It's crowding out all dissent. But boards like the ones we have here in North Carolina often govern poorly. Why should we expect better from them? Okay, well, I'll focus on um, public universities because each type of university, the situation is different. And that really was the uh, focus of my report. Um, public boards reflect the politics of the state. If you've just got Hopeless politics do not expect the board to um, improve your university system much. But um, there can be some really good improvements made if the boards get their own, um, get better information and better training. How can board members get better information and training? Well, the key to that is getting their own staff member, a high-level policy person who's very knowledgeable about higher education and is open-minded to uh, outside ideas. And um, if they get that uh, high-level staff member that's answerable to them, not to the administration, because that's how it usually works is the boards, if there's a board staff, they answer to the administration and um, that causes a conflict of interest. Um, but by having better information, that eliminates the asymmetry of information problem that many boards seem to suffer. They are because the administration is intimately involved with everything that goes on on the campus and the board are just uh, part-timers who aren't really that familiar with, the, uh, with academia, they can easily be manipulated by the administrations. And by getting this uh, staff member who can give them better information, that eliminates uh, that problem. And the same with training. If the training is conducted by that same staff member instead of uh, 
by somebody in the administration, the board can be told their full responsibilities and duties, and um, they can the boards can then take a much more active role. Does government get in the way of good board governance? Um, well, there's all kinds of outside actors that tend to interfere with the governance in higher education. Um, now, in my report, I focused on sort of a non-governmental actor, but they really get their authority, part of their authority from the government, and that is the accrediting agencies. And the problem with accrediting agencies is they kind of have this dual mission. On one hand, they exist to help university, is an they're kind of advisors to help universities and colleges get better. On the other hand, they're also the, the gateway to federal funding. In other words, if you're not accredited, you don't get federal financial aid, which for many tuition-driven schools is a death blow. Um, so they're able to, but because they are this gateway to federal funding, they can go to a school and say, we want this, 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 and this, and if you don't do that, we won't give you federal funding. Um, so that takes away a lot of the authority from the board and uh, really leaves the governance in a bad situation. Yes, there are a lot, there's things in uh, the government like Title IX, which is a major problem. Um, you know, it's forcing a lot of the staffing increases and a lot of the diversity measures. Um, and there's just uh, a lot of influences on higher education that didn't exist way back in the past. What recommendations do you offer in your report? Um, uh, the, I would, uh, just as I said kind of in the beginning, I'd kind of restore the hierarchy. Um, I'd um, and by putting boards atop the system and firmly in control. And in doing so, I would, this enables them to make societies confirms matter. And also, universities can return to a very firm commitment to truth as their main standard rather than social justice. And um, I make... Oh, a good number, 20-some recommendations in the paper. The board staff member is the first uh, and foremost, uh, not the first, but it's the most important, I would say. And just boards getting more involved, knowing their responsibilities and duties and their powers as well, because they have a lot of power that they don't use, often because they're not aware of it. Um, and I had, there was one I had a little fun with, and that's a, uh, uh, having, uh, board or having university officials and employees make a loyalty oath, not to a, not a political loyalty oath, not something where it's against their first amendment rights to, uh, you know, by making, compelling them to adopt a political opinion, but um, sort of a professional oath along the lines of the Hippocratic Oath, and that would be to the spirit of free inquiry and academic freedom. And this has like this, it contains like a beautiful contradiction. If somebody is not willing to make an oath to free inquiry and the and academic freedom, they are basically denying their own academic freedom and they can be fired. <laughs> um, so I, I just thought that that just seemed to be a little, it had a perfect symmetry and a perfect, uh, just a, a good way of restoring academia's focus on its primary mission. Hey. Well, Jay, thank you so much for, no, fun for being, here. being here today. Uh, if you've enjoyed this video, please like. And if you're not already, please subscribe to our Martin Center YouTube channel. You can find Jay's full report on our website, www.jamesgmartin.center. Thank you.